All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome and good morning. Uh, so glad so many of you could be here virtually to join us on Zoom for the launch of the St. Louis Regional Chambers COVID-19 Business Resilience Series. As you all know, the outbreak of COVID-19 is having a profound impact on our region's community and of course our businesses. The St. Louis Regional Chamber remains committed to serving as a convener and advocate for our members, investors, and community partners during these challenging times. I'm Austin Walker, Vice President of Public Policy at the St. Louis Regional Chamber, and today I'm very excited that we have four outstanding speakers that will discuss key legislation at the local, state, and federal level and give some guidance for small businesses, including how they can apply for SBA disaster loans. We'll begin our meeting with a brief update from our Manager of Government Affairs, Adam Casta, on local and state government, followed by Allison Dimbeck with the U.S. Chamber, who will give a briefing on legislation at the federal level. At 10.30 a.m., Tom Diber with the Small Business Administration will discuss their initiatives and disaster assistance for small businesses, and we'll end with Kevin Wilson with the Small Business Development Center. Thank you again for joining us today, and now I'll pass it on to Adam. Adam's muted. Adam, sorry, hey, are you there? Okay. Yep, I am. Uh, thank you, Austin. Uh, my name is Adam Kazda, Manager of Government Affairs for the St. Louis Regional Chamber. Uh, I first want to start on a positive note that throughout this entire crisis, uh, we've seen local leaders, state leaders, uh, and now after last night, uh, our leaders in Washington on both sides of the aisle uh, come together uh, to combat the coronavirus. Um, it's truly a bipartisan issue. Uh, and it's good to see some of that in practice again today. Uh, starting locally, uh, I want to update everyone on the call uh, that Mayor Krusen, County Executives Page, Elman, Gannon, Brinker, uh, and Chairman Kern and Prinzler, as well as the Chamber and a few other business organizations have been participating in daily calls to coordinate and update each other during the, this public health and economic crisis. Um, beginning in Missouri, uh, on Monday, St. Louis City, St. Charles County, and St. Louis County uh, adopted stay-at-home orders. Uh, Franklin and Jefferson counties shortly filed suit this week. Um, those orders are substantially similar, um, and I won't go through all the details on the call today, but if you would like to see them for yourself and have not already, um, they're on our news and events update uh, in the COVID-19 Action Center on the St. Louis Chamber's website. Uh, that's stlregionalchamber.com. Um, there you'll find what an essential activity is um, and what an essential business is. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions on that from our members uh, and some of you as, as well on the call. Uh, the chamber was instrumental in changing some of those provisions uh, to make those stay at home orders more business and workforce friendly. Um, but I think it's important to note at this point, uh, all the local leaders uh, are in constant contact uh, with one another and have been uh, moving in a unit. Um, we have the regional chamber advocating that it stays that way uh, to make sure um, it's easier on our uh, businesses and workforce during this troubling time. Um, moving over to Illinois, uh, our local elected leaders have also been joining Missouri local leaders in coordination. Uh, however, both states are opposites when it comes uh, to their governors. Um, in Illinois, um, many of the decisions are made from the top down, uh, while Missouri is letting a lot of the localities take the first step. Um, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker uh, issued a, a statewide stay-at-home order last Saturday, uh, March 21st, uh, kind of circumventing any action our local leaders in Illinois uh, could have taken with their partners in Missouri this week. Um, as Governor Pritzker has uh, higher office aspirations, um, he seems to be at, at odds with the president and is acting quicker than most governors throughout the country, um, kind of moving towards the General Assembly in Illinois. Um, it's unclear when they will come back in town, um, but uh, the chamber is monitoring that closely. Um, on the other side of the river uh, in Missouri, like I mentioned, uh, Governor Parson has very much let the localities make the first move. Uh, the regional chamber sent a letter last week asking the governor to take more action, and he has, um, but just not at the pace um, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has. Um, as Allison from the U.S. Chamber uh, will mention shortly, uh, both states um, received about 13 and $14 million 
uh, and federal funding um, in phase one from Congress to combat the uh, coronavirus. Um, however, each state has different rules, and by declaring a state of emergency, Governor, Governor Pritzker kind of unlocked those funds, if you will, uh, while Governor Parson uh, will need the General Assembly to grant him the authority to spend those funds from Congress. Uh, the Missouri House has passed that authority along with the Supplemental Appropriations Package last week. Um, it is unclear at this point when the Missouri Senate will come back to send the bill to the governor's desk. Uh, but there are rumors that will be uh, mid to late April. Um, so we're, uh, you know, constantly um, in contact with uh, the governor's staff and, um, and, and other folks in the, uh, the General Assembly. Uh, just want to let everyone know the chamber is constantly working with every, every level of le elected leader um, to best protect our business and workforce community. Uh, and if you have any questions related to public policy and the coronavirus, please feel free to shoot them uh, to me in an email. Uh, we will be sending that information in a follow up email after the call. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Austin. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I appreciate the update. I'd like to now pass it on to Allison Dimbach, the Executive Director of Congressional and Public Affairs at the United States Chamber of Commerce. Allison is Executive Director in the Congressional and Public Affairs Division at the U.S. Chamber, focusing on education, labor, and workforce development issues. Before coming to the U.S. Chamber in 2012, Allison was the Education, Labor, Pensions, and Welfare Policy Analyst on the Senate Republican side and has spent many years in the halls of Congress. Please welcome Allison Dimbeck. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for um inviting me and, and, and taking the time to jump on the call. Um, I hope you all are home and safe and healthy. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, so thank you. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to give a kind of a federal update. Um, there, there has been a lot going on um, and there's been a lot of bipartisanship, which I think is, is, is a sign that this country really does um, pull together when, when we need to. Um, Phase one of the coronavirus relief was actually passed at the beginning of, of March. It was all appropriations. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I won't go too much into that, but um, phase two is, is kind of where we started to see some of the other uh, policy items jump up. And, and phase two of the, the relief packages came, um, passed the house on March 14th, um, and then it passed the Senate on um, March 18th, uh, and then the president signed it into law pretty pretty quickly, um, also on March 18th. And um, that that bill laid out um, a number of food assistance items for um, to address people with food insecurities. Uh, so I don't I'm not going to talk too much about them. I can answer those questions if 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 folks are have any, but that's not really our focus today. Um, what I'll focus on is the paid uh, paid leave requirements, and there are a number of paid leave requirements in there, and 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 they're going to change a little bit in the the phase three legislation that was passed uh, through the Senate last night. Um, just kind of as a quick update on that, uh, I won't get into too much detail about um, about that bill, although I'm going to give a, a bit since it hasn't been signed into law yet. However, it passed the Senate last night um, on a, oh, a 96, I think it was, um, 96 to zero. So it, it passed unanimously last night at like one o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, and is sent over to the House. The House of Representatives is, um, the Speaker has called the House back into session. Um, they will vote on Friday morning. They're going to do a voice vote, though. It's expected to pass. Uh, that'll give them enough time to kind of work their members on why they should let the vote go through instead of make them all come in and do a roll call vote, uh, which I think everybody is really trying to avoid for, for obvious reasons. Um, and that phase three bill you might hear called, um, it's the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act. So you might hear it called phase three, you might hear it called um, CARES Act, but it, it's the same thing. And that's where uh, a number of the small business uh, provisions and, and loans and, and all that will, will show up. So back to the paid leave bill. Um, so the paid leave bill sets up um, some paid sick leave 
um, some paid, um, oh, and there was just a question, the, the, the name. So the name of the, so the name of the phase two bill is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That was phase two. That's already passed and been signed into law. And the phase three bill is the CARES Act. It's Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security. And I can, after the talk, I'll put them down in the chat so that you guys can have them, um, have those names handy. And then, so the, the, the phase two bill set up paid sick leave, um, paid family leave, and it started opening up the uh, unemployment uh, requirements. And um, all of the paid leave is for employers who have fewer than 50 employees. Um, it, that's whether we're talking paid sick leave or paid family medical leave, it's for employers who have fewer than 50 employees. Uh, it's all refundable, the, the money is all refundable. The way it was set up in phase two is gonna change a little bit because um, they're trying to make it easier in phase three. Um, but it, the idea is for it to be refundable through um, tax credits and filing of your quarterly taxes. Um, and that's also with both the paid sick leave and the paid family medical leave. Um, there, the way it's going to change is that um, instead of having to outlay it up front, um, the employers will be able, once the new bill is signed into law, employers will be able to actually um, keep the money that would have been deposited uh, for payroll taxes in anticipation of the refunds. Uh, this way tries to help with some of those uh, liquidity issues. And both the paid sick leave and paid family medical leave requirements uh, are, sun, are, are specifically tied to COVID-19 and they are set to sunset uh, on December 31st, 2020. So the idea was not to set up a mandatory paid sick or um, family medical leave um, at, you know, for, for the long term. And so the way the paid sick leave works is that it's, um, paid 10 days of sick leave for full-time employees. For part-time employees, it's paid sick time for the typical number of hours that they would work over a two week period of time. Um, the paid sick leave is on top of whatever leave the employer already offers, and that includes whatever state and local requirements there are. So this is in, in addition to all of that. If employees are out because they're subject to a government quarantine, because a health provider has told them to self-quarantine or because they're uh, experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis, those individuals get compensated at either their regular rate, the federal, federal minimum wage, or the local minimum wage, whatever is the higher of those rates. If the person is out because they are caring for somebody else who is under quarantine orders, for if they're caring for children whose schools or childcare are closed, um, or if they're experiencing conditions that are outlined um, by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, but are not actually currently seeking medical diagnosis, those folks only get two thirds of the rate of what they would actually um, receive. And those rates are, are capped in the, in the statute. If you're self-employed, and you would have been eligible for the paid sick leave if you had been employed by somebody else, then you are also eligible for those, those tax credit, those sick leave tax credits. When it, in, um, when it comes to um, exclusions, um, the uh, healthcare providers and emergency responders, um, those employers, can exclude their paid um, sick leave um, from, the, um, from the requirements. And the secretary uh, is working, I think actually she might have, he might have um, issued regulations yesterday and I, I admittedly have not had a chance to look um, that specifically would exempt businesses with fewer employees, um, with, I'm sorry, fewer than 50 employees from paying the employee the sick leave only in the instance of that person um, being out to care for a child and only when it would jeopardize the viability of the business. So um, 
it's 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 a very limited uh, restriction, and I, I should say because there's a couple of questions popping up. Um, this is for all employees. Um, this is um, this is for all employers, not um, not just um, for-profit employers. This is for nonprofit employers. This is for any employer who has fewer than 500 employees. Um, so those sick leave requirements, those FMLA requirements, it's for everybody who has fewer than 500 employees. If you have fewer than 50 employees and you are your business is going to be jeopardized by giving leave to somebody so that they can take care of their sick child or if they can take care of their child because their schools are closed, that you might be able to get a waiver for, but that's the only instance. Um, in terms of the paid FMLA leave, again, fewer than 500 employees, it's um, 12 weeks of paid FMLA, and it is only for individuals who are taking off to care for a child whose school is closed or their daycare is closed and are unable to telework. And that's an important um, factor. They can't just say, well, my kids are, are home, so I'm, I, I want paid FMLA. They have to not be able to, um, to telework. That those employees are only eligible after they've used up that 10 days of paid leave, um, and they get two thirds of their regular rate of pay. And that's kind of the, the way that the paid um, leave requirements work. Um, there was also extensions um, given, so the Secretary of Labor had regulated to try to open up um, unemployment insurance to give states some flexibility to open that up um, for employees as they were starting to be furloughed. Um, there were some things the Secretary couldn't do that were, had to be done by statute. That included waiving the waiting periods um, in order to be eligible for um, UI. So that was included. It also includes waiving the um, able, available, and actively looking for a job uh, test, uh, which seemed pretty important in this instance. And then um, it provided a billion dollars for states um, to their unemployment programs. And all of that is gonna, um, so that's kind of the summary of, of phase two. Um, Phase three is going to expand on that um, a little bit, particularly on, not a little bit, a lot, um, particularly on the um, unemployment side of things and what is eligible, um, who is eligible. It extends the length of time, so it's 13 weeks. It would be 13 weeks. Um, there's um, some extra money, $600 um, on top of it. Uh, that would be available uh, as long as the state enters into an agreement with the uh, federal government. Um, and there's a whole host of, of reasons that unemployment would be available. The idea being that as employers have to furlough employees, that they can collect the un unemployment insurance, but that when all of this passes and employers are able to get back to whatever the new normal is going to be, that they can bring those employees back on. Let me just touch very briefly on, especially because I saw that there were some questions about um, some of the, the loan programs. Um, I, there was a specifically a question I saw about whether the, the um, whether loans would be available to um, all nonprofits or towards um, just um, 501c3s um, and um, in the Small Business Protection Program, which is one of the programs, they did not open that language back up to 501c6s. That, that program is specifically going to be for small businesses, which um, using the standard uh, definition, um, the SBA size standard, um, 501c3 nonprofits with fewer than 500 employees and sole proprietors. There are other... Um, changes to the Economic and Injury, Injury Disaster Loan Program that would include 501 C6s. So that includes all nonprofits. So there is some relief in there, but it didn't get opened up um, as much as the, you know, the chambers, both on the, you know, the U.S. Chamber, but I know also you guys on the, on the local level uh, were, were advocating for it to, to, to do. My hope is that that conversation is going to, I mean, 
we definitely will be continuing that conversation um, because there's going to be additional legislation. The House has already introduced uh, a bill that they're putting out as phase four. And so our, you know, our intent is to continue that conversation, um, you know, go, going forward. Um, so I don't know, um, Adam, I don't know, do you want to do questions? I, there were questions that came in through the chat. I, I don't know, I should have asked, are we opening it up for questions? I could keep talking about what's in the CARES Act, but like I said, it's not signed into law yet. So I, I worry about doing too much of that. Sure, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, um, you know, I guess just like more specifically and more generally, you know, what should employers know? Uh, specifically about the paid leave and and loan part. Um, I know a lot of folks have been emailing about uh, the, I know the phase three hasn't been signed into law, but uh, there's something in there about the loans being totally forgiven um, and whether, you know, which loan should they apply for things like that. I, I don't, I don't want us to give any advice, but just wanted to touch on, you know, will the loans be forgiven? Um, in phase three, what, what what are you seeing with that? Sure. Um, so yeah, definitely um, don't construe anything that I'm, I'm, I'm giving as advice. Obviously every business has got to make the decisions that are, that are best for them. Um, so the small business paycheck protection program is going to be a $349 billion program. Um, it's um, going to have a um, 100% guarantee as opposed to the 75% guarantee that's in the 7A, um, the SBA 7A loans. Um, as I said, the, the eligibility is, is small businesses are defined the, the, the way the SBA um, size standards are, are generally defined. Um, there is, the idea is that the maximum loan is going to be um, essentially your monthly payroll costs for two and a half months, um, but not to exceed $10 million. Also, it is not to include compensation for individuals, including anybody who is self-employed, um, if they make over $100,000 a year. And, and that requirement is, is in, the, in the law in several, several places. The idea, um, one of the requirements of getting this, um, the Paycheck Protection Program loans is that the employer has to certify that they will use, that they will retain the workers, that they will maintain, um, that they're using the money to retain workers, um, that they're using the money for payroll, for mortgages or leases. I know that question comes up, uh, you know, about being able to afford the facilities. Um, it's, so it, it is for that and it's also to pay utilities. The loan forgiveness portion of it is that the loan would be forgiven in the amount equal to those payroll costs and interest payments on mortgages and rent payments and utility payments from February 15th through June 30th. However, the forgiveness is going to be reduced if employers um, reduce the, the number of employed individuals or if they reduce salary or wages. So, um, it's if they reduce them under the salary or wages by more than 25%. So the idea about this loan is to try to keep everybody um, where they are in terms of salary, wages, and employment. And so reductions in the loan forgiveness will happen if, if there's a reduction in workforce or salary. That's great. Uh, just uh, briefly, uh, you know, what was the U.S. Chamber's impact as well as local chambers um, on the CARES Act or, or any of the phases, um, just kind of a behind the scenes look? Oh, I mean, I think that there was a big, I think there was a big impact. We were hearing, um, I was hearing um, from state and local chambers uh, almost immediately um, on the difficulty of waiting for the quarterly tax, um, your totally qu quarterly tax um, credits in order to do the paid sick leave and paid family medical leave. So we, we pushed really hard to say, this is, this is going to be a problem for our folks. And that's why there will be changes. Those are the changes um, about being able to credit that amount of money forward. Um, in terms of making sure that rents and, and, and mortgages 
were part of what is allowed in the loan forgiveness. That was something we were hearing a lot about. Um, so we we did a lot of conversations. We obviously weren't successful in everything. We've had a lot of conversations about this C6 issue, which is obviously a problem since um, state and local, and honestly, including the Fed of the US Chamber, um, we're, we're C6 organizations. Uh, part of the problem there is that I think um, on the one side of the aisle, the Democrats really didn't want to give um, you know, to help out lobbying organizations like trade associations and all. On the other side of the aisle, the Republicans really were concerned about the cost of giving it to C6s. And so we're still pushing on that to make sure that they understand that C6s are, are, are much broader than, you know, folks like just the U.S. Chamber. So, um, so, so that's a work in progress. So I think we had an impact, but it's definitely a lot of ongoing conversations. Right, absolutely. And uh, we did have a question come in um, earlier um, about any rent relief legislation. Um, maybe that's in a phase four or it, was, that, was that an addressed in the CARES Act or any um, other legislation along the lines of um, rent, tenants, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, for businesses, um, the idea was to try to address rent payments um, through the Small Business pay Paycheck Protection Program for um, individuals who, uh, who, you know, are for their homes and all for that, there's been some, there's been eviction, um, you know, a halt on, on evictions and, and foreclosures. I think there's still conversations ongoing about how else to address that issue. Uh, it, people are, people are concerned about it, but, um, that most of what, what is in there in the CARES Act has to deal with through that lending program. Okay, and, and just a couple more questions um, I see coming through on the chat. Um, I know we don't wanna give away any, you know, any advice, but um, some folks are asking, you know, whether they should wait for to apply for any loan um, in phase three or, um, and uh, will these uh, loans be applied for the same way through the Small Business Administration um, when phase three passes? So I might leave some of that for, for okay. Tom and Kevin to talk about because they probably are in a better in a better spot to talk about what's kind of what's happening um, regulatorily, what's happening with these with, with these loans and, and the best way to proceed. Okay, great. Sorry, and, to, uh, sorry to punt that. <laughs> no, no worries. And uh, just finally, you know, what should we be looking for on the horizons? Uh, you know, what should small businesses be looking at? Larger businesses? Um, will there be more legislation coming from Congress? Um, just kind of uh, look into your crystal ball. Um, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Um, I so there's definitely going to be more legislation. I think. Um, there's continue. There's already continuing to be fights on expanding the paid leave requirements. So I would continue to to watch for that. Um, I think there's concern that there's not that people are being pushed into the unemployment um, unemployment arena, and and there should be more being done for paid leave. I think that from where we sit, that's a that's a hard ask. Um, I think from where you guys sit, that might be a hard ask too. Uh, not that we're not concerned about the employees, we are, but we want want to make sure that there are still businesses to to employ them. Um, I think that that's going to be the big thing. I think there's going to continue to be looking at specific industries. Um, we've been hearing a lot, for example, from the tourism industry and difficulty that uh, states that rely um, heavily on tourism outside of just airlines and and all of that, but hotels and conferences and. And I'll, I think that there's going to be a, a closer look at, at the airline, at the tourism industry, and how to help them. And I think there's going to be a continuing focus on how how do we, what, are there other things we can do to help small businesses because um, small businesses are are are, are really having a, a rough time. Fantastic, Allison. Thank you very much for your insights in the current situation at the federal level. Um, and now uh, we'll hear from Tom Daver, a, leading, uh, a lead lending specialist at the Small Business Administration. Tom, go ahead. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting SBA to, to make this presentation at uh, your webinar. Things are changing, uh, if not by the, the day, by the hour and by the minute. So we'll try to get you up to date on what's happening within the SBA's 
uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. You want to take the next slide? So the SBA is a federal agency. You see a picture of our new administrator. She was a U.S. Treasurer, so she may be on uh, the paper money that you've got in your in your pocket, in your wallet, in your purse. Uh, she is now the administrator for SBA. She sits on President uh, Trump's cabinet, and she's the advocate uh, within the federal government for small businesses. Next slide. So <clears throat> you'll hear me refer to the EIDL loans. Those are economic injury disaster loans. SBA generally uses, uh, the loan program generally has lenders make the loans and SBA provides guarantees to those lenders, except for in a disaster situation. In a disaster situation, SBA makes the loans directly to small businesses. So we do not go through the lenders. The borrowers will submit applications directly to SBA and SBA will uh, make loans directly to those businesses. <laughs> There's two major types of disaster uh, loans available. One is for physical disasters, for tornadoes, floods, et cetera. Uh, what we're dealing with now with the coronavirus is an economic injury disaster loan program. Uh, and basically, uh, all small businesses are able to apply for that. Uh, what you would go by would be your North American Industry Classification System code, your NACE code. And for each individual industry, then it's broken down either by total revenues or by total employees, and you have to be under those thresholds to be considered small. Um, basically, any business that's been affected by the disaster is eligible for assistance. I believe every state and, and all the territories within the United States have now qualified for uh, disaster assistance loans. Next page. So how do you, what are the criteria for loan approval? One is SBA will look at the applicant's credit history. If the business was not able to pay loans before the virus, uh, that may be an indication that there were other problems. Uh, since we're using federal dollars uh, to make these loans directly to the borrowers, uh, there has to be an indication that the loan can be repaid. So credit history will factor into the decision. Um, eligibility, uh, basically the applicant business has to be located in the declared county. And in this case, I think every county and every state in the, in the United States would qualify. Next, page, next slide. So businesses can apply for up to $2 million or are, are eligible for up to $2 million in uh, the disaster loan as the maximum. Interest rates are fixed at 3.75% uh, for 30 years. For nonprofits, that rate is 2.75%. Uh, the eligibility for these working capital lines are based on the size of the business that we talked about. And you can apply, uh, you can use the funds to basically pay fixed debts for payroll, accounts payable, and other bills. It's basically a working capital uh, a loan scenario. One uh, factor is the loans cannot be used to refinance long-term debts, but you can make pay your monthly payments on your long-term debts. Next slide. For the collateral requirements, economic injury disaster loan, under $25,000 can be unsecured. There's no collateral available. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, so things are changing by the, the moment. Uh, SBA will not take legal state as collateral on the ED, EIDL loans. That is a change from the standards. Normally, SBA takes collateral on real estate uh, because of this disaster. SBA is foregoing taking uh, real estate as collateral. We will, SBA will take a lien on the business assets of the business and SBA will not decline a loan for lack of collateral. You can apply uh, online. Uh, the eligible businesses are, include hotels, uh, restaurants, retailers. Um, I got a slide later coming up on those who are not eligible. So most businesses are eligible for assistance. And we talked about being present in the declared area, which really is not applicable because everyone's in the disaster area right now. Next slide. So the uh, working capital loans are a little bit different than the physical loans, as we talked about. They come directly from the U.S. Treasury. Um, you do not go to your bank to apply. You go online uh, to apply, disasterloan.sba.gov. Uh, there is no cost to, to apply, and there is no obligation to take the money if it's offered and you're approved. If you take the money, there's no prepayment penalty, so you can pay it back at any point in time. Um, and you can still have, you can have an existing a uh, disaster loan, if you had a loan from flooding for a few years ago, you can still apply for, for an EIDL. Next slide. 
So basically firing requirements, there's a form five, which is basically an application. Uh, later in the slides, uh, there's a bunch of slides with yeah, uh, page by page of the application. And uh, I'm not gonna go through those in great detail uh, for lack of time. I think it's probably more beneficial to field questions and, and go into answering issues that are of importance here. But there's basically an application form. There is a IRS form 4506T. Since we're using federal tax dollars uh, to uh, fund these loans, we do need to verify that the businesses have paid taxes. Uh, this does show that copies of tax returns are required. That is also a change. Uh, SBA is waiving the, t the uh, tax returns, so you do not need to provide tax returns for uh, the disaster loan application. You will need to provide a form, the 4506T, which authorizes SBA to verify that you have filed your tax return. There's also a schedule of liabilities. Uh, Part of the, the reason the underwriter will want to look at that is to want to see what the total debts of the business are, what your monthly payments are, uh, to make sure that you have enough cash flow to basically to be re, to re, determine the amount of the loan and then to repay the loan. The application does not actually ask you not ask for a specific amount of loan. The underwriter will look at the financial information that you do provide and qualify you and offer a particular amount back, and then they will discuss to, discuss that with you to determine what your business will need. Um, and then the personal financial statement, you will need to provide a personal financial statement form. And for all SBA loans, uh, they do need to be personally guaranteed by any owner that owns 20% of the company. Next slide. Other information that may be required are uh, the tax returns, our schedules, um, as well as a current year-to-date profit and loss statement. And there's also for the ED, EIDL loans, there's a form 1368 which provides monthly sales figures for the last uh, three years. Um, it's helpful if you're submitting a, a, an application online, you have the option of including that form or adding that, and you can, you can include that, but that's not required. Your loan may be approved without it, uh, but the underwriter reserves the right to come back and ask for additional information if they need that. Next slide. So why are some businesses, some of the businesses that are not eligible? Agricultural enterprises are not eligible. Uh, basically, Farm Service has uh, handles the disaster loans for the ag community, so you would not go to SBA for an ag business. Religious organizations are not eligible. In a physical disaster, uh, churches, as an example, are eligible for physical disaster SBA loans, but economic injury disaster loan religious organizations, including churches, are not eligible. Uh, gambling concerns, obviously, are not eligible, as well as casinos and racetracks, those are some of the examples that are not eligible. Next slide. So how do you apply? Uh, there's a website set up for the applications. Uh, you can also go to sba.gov forward slash disaster. Um, there is an option to mail in the application. You can print out the forms and mail it in, and that address is on here in Fort Worth, Texas. SBA strongly recommends that you do it online. Uh, it's faster, uh, it will be processed faster, and you will get an application confirmation uh, submission uh, upon completing the application so you know that SB has the application in uh, in process and then you will also be able to go back if you file online and update uh, go to back and sign into your account and check the status to see uh, where it is in the process if you send it in uh, by mail you will not be able to to do that the phone number for disaster customer service is on this this slide as well as an email address I can tell you that the SBA uh, website and uh, mailbox is uh, extremely stressed right now because of the, the sheer volume we're getting in. Uh, I have my contact information on here and our SBA staff uh, is willing and, and is feeling questions and comments, so we're, we're willing to help. Uh, we're not as adept at the disaster loans as the disaster folks who deal with it every day, but uh, we are here to assist as a backup if you're not able to get through to the, to the disaster customer service center. Next slide. Um, Kevin uh, Wilson is, is one of them is going to talk after me here, and he's going to represent and talk about uh, some of the resources that are available from SBA's resource partners. SBA provides uh, funding uh, for resource partners so that they can provide free mentoring and counseling for, for small businesses. And so we have the Small Business Development Center, SCORE, which is a group of uh, volunteers. Uh, the Women's Business Center and the Veterans Business Center. So we have some great resources available 
along as well as the local chambers of commerce that we encourage uh, folks to uh, help with. So SBA provides fi the financing and the counseling is available through uh, our resource partners. Uh, and the other thing that SBA does provide is also access to governmental contracting. So uh, businesses are looking for uh, ways to expand their revenue source. You can also contact our office so we can help you with, with that. And next slide. Recommend submit your application as soon as possible. Um, we check the filing requirements to make sure you got all the information, make sure it's a complete application. That will obviously help uh, speed it through the process. Um, the biggest reason for delays is, is missing information. So if you submit all the application forms with your application, it certainly helps move it along faster. If more funds are needed, you can come back and ask for an increase. So um, you would not need to, to make a new application. We contact the disaster situation. If this drags on longer than anyone expects, as an example, uh, you can come back and increase that. If a loan is denied, we'd recommend that you work with one of our resource partners to find to work on the reason for the denial, and you can come back um, and within six months and, and reapply for uh, for that application. Next slide. Um, let me skip through this questions, and let me just go through these next slides very quickly with the with the sample of the site. Here is the SBA's website uh, where you would go. So if you go to sba.gov forward slash disaster, this is what you'll see. In the upper right hand corner, you can see it says in blue, apply online. You would click on that. There's also a big blue circle. So you click on that and that would take you to the application. The search declarations is not really applicable as I mentioned um, because all areas are uh, included in disaster. Illinois and Missouri both have declared disaster, so you can apply for uh, a disaster loan under those declarations. And then loan information will take you to more information on the loans, including uh, the paper forms. And then as, after you've uh, submitted your application, you come back in and click on that green button that says check application status, and that will tell you where your application is in the process. Next slide. Okay, this is, talks about uh, uh, more detail on the Form 5 and the SBA forms that you'd file. Next slide. We touched on these different forms already that you would be providing. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so I mentioned this is you can apply online by clicking on the blue uh, uh, box up front. Here's where you would register. So first thing you'll need to do is create your account. You would create your username, your password, uh, then you'd be able to log back in and access your information. If you are submitting online, uh, because of the sheer volume, uh, from time to time, folks have gotten kicked out. So as you're submitting an application, we recommend saving as often as you can. So if you do get kicked out, you can sign back in and get back to where you were left off. Next slide. This is, talks about uh, the registration and basically what it, as you go through the application, there's red asterisks on each of the different questions. There was a red asterisk by a box, you'd need to provide that answer to that question before you can advance on the application. Next slide. Um, basically, you, you'll click on apply online and then you will, in this case, because it's a business uh, economic disaster, you would select a box business and uh, nonprofits. Next slide. And then you would select a type of business. In this case, it's selected limited liability, entity, and economic injury. Next slide. Uh, then you would enter, this goes back to, you have to specifically re uh, reference a declared disaster area. This is really set up because the physical disasters also apply. So when you're applying for disaster loan, you have to, to show. So what you do is you enter in uh, your state and your county, and then it would pull up uh, a list of available disasters, you click on one of those. In this case, you click on uh, the coronavirus uh, disaster. Next slide. This is basically your, your disclaimers that you're entering a federal site. Next slide. Uh, and then you would start with your application, click on disaster business loan application, hit the blue start button, and it would take you through step-by-step -step, uh, filling out and answering all those questions. Next. That's page one of the form, basically starting out at your economic injury application, uh, your type of business, you fill in your name and address. Next slide would be answering questions, keep going. Just flip through these. Here you'd file different information. Um, you just kind of walk through these one by one and let folks kind of glance at them. We'll get these slides uh, at the end of the presentation so I can go through more detail.
there's a the, you'll get a successfully completed application here you can go back in and recheck your check your status There's some information in there about the uh, home loan application. There's sort of duplicate slides, and this is our standard presentation that may not apply to this one. There's your, you get the application submission confirmation after you, you complete your application. Uh, you'll see the, the message saying that your application uh, submission was successful. It takes it through the slides there. I can, uh, however you yeah. like, if you want hey, to. Hey, Tom, this is, uh, this is Adam. Um, got a few questions uh, that we have time for. Um, looks like it's it's fairly uh, straightforward the the process. Um, we're going to make these slides uh, available to folks. Uh, would you say it's fairly uh, descriptive in walking through the uh, the PowerPoint? I would I would say so. There's there's some uh, information that may not be intuitive. One of the questions that we see the most errors on is question number sixteen. It asks. Uh, basically, do you own other businesses? And people get tripped off, up on that because we're not uh, asking you to, again, disclose your ownership in your current business you're applying for. What we're asking for is do you own any other businesses? So uh, because of the size standard, uh, SBA can only provide loans to businesses that are, that are of a, they qualify as small. So folks are answering yes, that they own that business, but that's not what we're asking for. So if you answer that yes, you get tripped up. So if you don't own any other businesses, you check no, and that will that will allow you to to proceed. But most of the information is is fairly, I think, intuitive. Okay, great. And uh, I, I, we've got this question a couple times on the chat. Uh, would a U.S. company that is foreign owned qualify for a loan? Do you know that? Um, it would have to be a, a, at least fifty one percent owned by a U.S. Okay, uh, thank you. Business. And uh, would phase three um, also apply through the Small Business Administration? Um, if that um, yeah, Allison touched on some of this stuff and I'll just couch my comments by it's still in Congress. The Senate did pass it. The House will take it up apparently tomorrow. Um, so we don't, haven't seen a whole lot, but uh, other than what I've seen in, in media, which, which you have shared, but what I understand the process is, as proposed by the Senate is that uh, whereas this current uh, disaster loan declaration allows you to apply directly to the SBA for $2 million under the CARES Act, you'd be able to apply for up to $10 million, and that would be done through your SBA uh, lenders, your 7A lenders. So you'd go to uh, directly to the banks and credit unions to apply for the CARES Act loan. Great. And I, and I believe under the CARES Act, should that pass, that uh, leases and utilities um, are covered under uh, the new loans. Is that the same for the disaster loans? Um, I don't know the specific uh, that they can as, currently apply for. Yeah, I, I would. I'm not sure on the actual use of those funds. I have not uh, seen that. I know it's really tied up. Generally, what I've seen most of the discussion on has been around the, the payroll and the, the forgiveness of that, that portion of that. I would assume that would be a parallel track, but I, I can't answer that for sure. Okay, great. And uh, we, we've also been getting some questions about would these, would the uh, Small Business Administration disaster loans that you can apply for now uh, be eventually forgiven um, if the business is able to meet all the, the, uh, the qualifications um, like the CARES Act would? Um, I do not believe so. Unless the legislation includes anything, the current legislation does not allow give a, a authority SBA to forgive disaster loans. So the way the law is written currently, disaster loans would not have debt forgiveness. Okay, so, you know, don't wanna, you know, recommend any specific position, but um, that's set definitely something for companies to look at uh, the disaster loan. Um, uh, Cause we've, we've been getting some questions about should, um, should these companies wait and see what comes out of the CARES Act or apply now? Um, so would you have any, any statement on that? Yeah, I mean, I think your advice to them is is sound. If if the if they are able to wait uh, a, a few days, if Congress is able to get the CARES Act through, then we'd have a lot more detail 
on the economic industry disaster loan, the EIDL. They have nine months to apply, so there's no rush from a timing standpoint, other than obviously, you know, the individual business as far as what they need from from uh, how much, you know, how quickly they need the, the loans. I would say that under the disaster loan program, if they want to pursue a disaster loan, and the processing time right now that we're being told is is three weeks, and that may expand depending upon the volume of applications coming in, but uh, they can go to their lender today and get a interim loan, and then if they qualify for disaster loan, they can pay off that interim loan with a disaster loan for the 30-year fix. So that might be one other a solution uh, uh, to consider. Thanks so much, Kevin. And and anything um, before uh, we go to the next presenter that you'd like to share with the group? No, I think uh, I think we kind of covered. Allison did a good job of, of kind of summarizing the uh, the proposal uh, for the CARES Act, and um, uh, I think uh, if that passes through Congress, as we talked about, the the plan then would be to work with uh, the local lenders uh, to get that money out and turned around fairly quickly. They would. Uh, there are a number of lenders that are uh, we call delegated lenders that are able to do the loans without SBAs even reviewing those loans. So. I think the goal, uh, listening to U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, Munchen has been mentioning that uh, he thinks that the, the loans will be able to be funded by the end of next week. And if Congress can get it passed, they certainly would put that into, we we'll work for the lenders to get that turned around and hopefully as quickly as possible. Awesome, Tom, thank you very much for your update. A lot of useful information in there. Um, to conclude our meeting, uh, we have Kevin Wilson, Executive Director of St. Louis's Small Business Empowerment Center. Kevin, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me now? We can indeed, thanks Kevin. Fantastic, uh, good morning everybody. I'm Kevin Wilson, I am Executive Director of the Small Business Empowerment Center, which is a sub-center of America's SBDC here in St. Louis. Um, uh, I am one of the uh, centers here in St. Louis and we do have other centers throughout uh, metropolitan St. Louis area. We also, in fact, have SBDCs throughout the state of Missouri. So. What is a Small Business Development Center? It is a program funded in part by the Small Business Administration uh, in partnership with the University of Missouri Extension. Uh, what SBDCs provide is technical assistance and managerial assistance to small business owners throughout the state of Missouri. Our mission is to promote growth, innovation, productivity, and revenue generation uh, for small businesses uh, through improvements of their business processes. During this crisis, we're holding business coaching sessions via conference calls and video chat. Normally, we do this one-on-one -on -one in our offices or at locations with small business owners. However, with the crisis, we are doing this virtually at this point. Uh, some of the uh, uh, services that the SBDC provide, and this is not an exhaustive list, but we will help clients through the process of applying for uh, SBA disaster loan or SBA uh, 7A loan through a bank. We also help uh, guide them through local incentives, uh, through the other programs that are for crisis alleviation. Also, we do general business uh, coaching and counseling in those areas of marketing, workforce development, finance, and strategic planning. Also, if you're interested, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people on the call who are not in St. Louis, but in surrounding uh, communities, uh, our state website is www.missourisbdc.org. You can find all our locations throughout the state uh, on that website and all of our direct contact information. And you can uh, uh, access some of our free online classes to help with small business recovery. A lot of our classes that we're, uh, uh, are, are now uh, on our uh, website and they are free and you can a lot of small business owners can take advantage of those if you're interested you can call our local office at area code 314-805-4900 once again we're here to help our small business community uh, 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 you know grow and and make it through this crisis and we're here to provide assistance 
Hey, Kevin, thanks so much. Uh, just, just to summarize, uh, so your organization, the Small Business Empowerment Center, would help uh, businesses apply for these small business or these disaster loans, as well as anything um, that would come through in the CARES Act um, that would apply through the Small Business Administration and could help answer some of these, uh, some of these questions that have been posed in the meeting. Absolutely, our counselors are ready to answer those kind of questions, those are very specific questions that they might have as they're filling out applications, and to also think through strategy about, you know, when to apply and how to apply, things like that. Perfect, thank you so much. And in, in, um, in, the, in the groups, uh, for the good of the order, uh, we will be uh, um, giving out everyone's information on the call um, to follow up. Um, Austin, if I'll, I'll pa pass it back to you. Thanks, Adam, and thank you, Kevin, for your update, and Tom and Allison, thank you for being with us today and sharing your expertise as well. Uh, please join us for our COVID-19 briefing next Tuesday, March 31st at 10 a.m. That'll feature updates from some of our regional elected leaders. Mayor Lida Krusen and Chairman Mark Kern have already expressed their intent to be on that call. We'll send out an invitation today so those interested can get on the list. Also, our second COVID-19 Business Resilience Series will take place next Thursday, April 2nd at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Spry Digital and STL Communications will be discussing the home workspace. Please email Riley Nix if you'd like more details on that. And thanks again to everybody for joining our virtual conference today. This meeting is adjourned.